Hi, I'm Michael Lang, and this is another in the series of recordings called In Their Voices. And today I have an opportunity to talk with Jeffrey Corey from Ireland. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. It's a delight to have you as part, uh, just to talk with you and to have you part yeah. of the series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much for your invitation. Sure. And would you say um, a bit about introduce yourself and um, to the viewers so they have a context for understanding um, some of the things that you want to be talking about today? Okay. So uh, I grew up in Dublin uh, way back in the 60s. Uh, and uh, probably what's helpful to know is uh, I grew up in a, a, what we might call a mixed family. My father was Catholic although he never told me he was Catholic. I had to find that out many years later. And then my mother was Methodist uh, and very strongly involved in her local Methodist church. So uh, I was introduced to that world, uh, to, to Methodism. But thankfully in Ireland, Methodism is a bit in the middle. It's in the middle between um, the big Presbyterian Calvinist church on one side and the Church of Ireland or Anglican Church on the other side in terms of the Protestant world. Uh, and, um, but, but then the South, we were in the minority uh, in the Republic of Ireland as opposed to Northern Ireland. And uh, at that stage, we were, would have been just about 5% of, uh, surrounded by a very strong Roman Catholic um, political and ecclesiastical culture. So Protestants uh, very much kept silent uh, over many years. Uh, so 60s, 60s was a, a, a not only a big world change, um, people in the Sorbonne and Paris, the American civil rights movement. So um, the influence of American civil rights came to Ireland uh, and broke out in 1968, 69. And I was about 20 years of age then a student at Trinity College in Dublin doing history and politics. So we were all obviously very interested in uh, what was happening up in Northern Ireland. And uh, it, the big, it came onto the world screen because of television. It just so happened in 1968 in October when the civil rights marched in Derry or parade in Derry, there was a phalanx of or you see policemen on one side and another on the other side, and they were hemmed in and they went at the civil rights marches. It probably would have never been recorded at all uh, or, or very little would have been known about it, but there was a television cameraman um, at that spot. And uh, a bit like what happens to social media today uh, in Black Lives Matter, somebody, the world saw what was happening on the streets. It could no longer be hidden. So we were uh, down in Dublin, uh, us as students or uh, Southern Protestants, we were very concerned about all of that. So I didn't probably realize at the time how that was going to be a huge big factor in my future professional work. Um, so um, uh, I, I did, completed my, my degree and then got a job in London and then came back in mid 70s and uh, connected with uh, a group of, of like peacemakers uh, who, were, who had founded the Glencree Centre for Reconciliation, which was in an old British military barracks up in the mountains, the hills. Yeah, we, we call them mountains, but over the States, you just, just would call them hills. <laughs> and uh, uh, so um, I, I connected with them. Um, and uh, uh, but it was mainly an ecumenical context. Uh, and the term a center for reconciliation, it's always a huge, big concept, a huge, big goal, uh, dream of what would, was needed in Ireland. But you see, <laughs> nobody knew how to do reconciliation or, or what, what uh, apart from morally announcing it, how do you do it? Um, and at that stage, there wasn't, uh, well, we didn't know about centers for conflict resolution or university master's courses. They didn't exist at that stage. 
because well we had to make it up as we went along how you act, how you actually do uh, reconciliation work so it was a very long journey um, to uh, to, con to to know how to do that um, and the big the big challenge for uh, you, you go out and you protest on the streets about peace um, it was John Hume who said uh, there comes a time when you have when you, a huge decision to come off the streets and to form and to organize yourselves into uh, some kind of, of political group or a, a group for change. So, um, so for peacemakers, uh, this, this crucial strategic shift from protest to how do you do peace work? So for us, it took a, a fair amount of time. And so I, I was involved um, because I was involved in youth work at the time and very interested in, uh, in, uh, in informal gatherings and uh, informal uh, learning and training. Um, I was trying to see, well, how do we enable people to sit down and talk with each other? Um, so we moved on into the, into the 80s. Uh, I became chairman uh, of the center and uh, we, we, we knew how to do debates. So we would, we would bring down Northern politicians, some from the nationalist side and some from the unionist side. And we put them behind the table in a hotel and have a public meeting. Um, so I, I just found it very, well, yeah, you, you, you get a good debate, but you see what happens to the politicians is they stay in position they just present their point of view and then you have a rebuttal on the other side and then a counter exchange. So it, it, you certainly hear a little bit about the argumentation and you hear a bit about what's important or the latest policy position, but does it get us anywhere uh, beyond that? And so I was in search for, effectively, I probably didn't know at the time, I was searching for a dialogue process where you could enable people in a, not a public setting, but in a private setting to sit down and talk to each other. So that started a journey. And um, I remember w one of the people I contacted in the early ages was Adam Curl, who is a great Quaker peacemaker. Uh, and we brought him over to Ireland. He just established uh, the Bradford School of Peace Studies in England. So, I thought, well, let's go to Bradford and hear the message or what do they have to teach us about <laughs> conflict resolution? So anyway, Adam came over and it was uh, the thing I really remember was reconciliation is about new relationships that get formed between people out of which come new understandings and out of new understandings come uh, change or come uh, uh, well, we, we, whatever, but it, there's a possibility of movement after that. So I was able to live on that message for a couple of years <laughs> to see how we would actually bring people into a room to uh, talk with each other. What, what was a more decisive event was I'm very, 1985 was the International Year of Youth. And uh, I was very, I got a great invitation to go to South Africa uh, for three months um, under what was called the Christian Fellowship. It was a kind of a Quaker, again, a Quaker uh, movement. Uh, and I met um, Herbie van der Merwe, who at the time was setting up a center for intergroup studies in, in Cape Town. And what I didn't know at the time was he was involved in the background, in back channels, of enabling people to talk between the ANC and the Afrikaners uh, in the height of emergency. And then he built a link with Nelson Mandela through his Winnie Mandela um, and with his with contacts he had in Afrikaners. So back channels are, are crucial, but they are secret. <laughs> and he couldn't tell, him, tell me at the time about it, but I, I have since, I since found out of that. And of course for peace work, we're finding out about that like, likewise in Ireland, that um, uh, some of the vital work that was on, we're only now beginning to hear something like 20, 30 years later as to what was, uh, how were vital 
um, contacts uh, and thinking and new, new, new relationships, new understandings were back to that uh, actually emerge. So anyway, I, the point I want to come to is he showed me uh, a new book that had just been published and he passed it over to me and it was Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and Bill or well, William Urey, we know him as Bill Urey. And I, and I looked and I said, oh my goodness, that's what I've been doing. Uh, how can I get a copy of this book, you know? So it was just amazing. Uh, of course, what, about 10 years later, I realized, well, is, you know, there's, that's too much into problem solving. Roger Fisher, uh, who I did actually meet a few times and visited him on his island um, uh, of Martha Vineyard. Um, so uh, it, it's, too, it, it, it's too business oriented. And it's uh, it, it the problem. There's a lot of work that has to be has to get going before you get to the problem solving stage. So that was all before me in terms of of learning about where to come. So anyway, I came back from South Africa in the mid 1980s, and um, uh, I, I said, well, if, if if that stuff is coming out of the United States, then I must go to the United States to discover the holy grail of conflict resolution out there. So we wrote around to see, could we get someone over? And um, we approached the, the Quakers in, in Pennsylvania, in, in, in the capital of Pennsylvania, which is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and, um, but um, we got an amazing offer from San Francisco. It was a guy called Ray Schonholtz. He had just finishing a year of his sabbatical. He said, yep, I have a week. I can come to Ireland for one week in May. So we didn't know how, what a blessing this was going to be because Ray was a real pioneer of community mediation. And he had such fantastic links with um, philanthropic uh, groupings. So we, we got him to Dublin and uh, I also shared some of the costs of getting and got him up to Belfast as well. And uh, well, in Ireland, we're used to you, you invite a few people to a meeting and you might expect five to turn up or eight to turn up. Well, we got something like 15 to turn up or 20 to turn up to raise meeting. So I said, oh, we're, we're definitely onto something here, uh, whether for myself or for others, there's something important here. So he introduced us really to the whole world of mediation and community mediation in particular. But what was uh, the real blessing was when he went back home to San Francisco, he managed to get uh, a grant from the Eisenhower Foundation to invite uh, two of us, and it turned out to be three of us from Ireland to go over to San Francisco. And we got this solid uh, weeks training in community mediation and also a couple of days training in how do you set up a community mediation center. So it was just a fantastic opportunity and we'll uh, forever be grateful and unfortunately Ray passed away there a couple of years ago. Uh, I met his, his, uh, his widow uh, recently on a visit to San Francisco and thanked them very much for their contribution. So Americans have been, North Americans have been very important to us in Ireland uh, and yourself, Michael, in the way you've given us time and, and been over to, to meet us. And arising from that, um, uh, we, we learned a, the, the community mediation model, we were taught was something like seven stages in it. Um, and it was very much influenced by um, two people called Strauss and Doyle of interaction associates who are very much into the interaction bit uh, at the beginning. So, so important to get people talking and working through the story, hearing the story. Um, and um, one of the people who, who were the three, one of the three of us was John, well, it was John Brody, but also his sister, Christina O'Neill. And amazingly, the previous year, she had been in London uh, with the London Mennonites and Ron Crable had come over from um, uh, uh, Pennsylvania direction, a a a a is it Akron, uh, Akron, I think, isn't it? Um, 
uh, where, where Mennonites were headquartered. And um, so she, she, was, she was having detention because the Ron Crable model is only four uh, phases or four steps. And we had the seven stages of community boards. So which model were we going to teach? Were we going to teach the four step thing or the seven step thing? What we loved about the Ron Crable model was he called it storytelling. And that for us in Ireland, we're, we're big into hearing the story and hearing the relationship. So we sat down and um, so I'm going to show you, see if we can put up on screen what we came up with. Um, and um, uh, right, uh, is it, we get up now. Oh, oh, wait now. Uh, sorry, that one. There we are. Are, are you getting, are you seeing that? Absolutely. I just do, there we are, okay. Very clear. So, good, so um, we took Ron Crable's model, the opening storytelling. I was talking to, uh, at least I emailed with, with Ron, where did you get the storytelling name from? And it so happened that he was doing some narrative theology at the time and he liked the whole idea of storytelling so he put that in to to number two and uh, so and then so but he didn't have framing the issues and we thought that the community boards model was very good how after you hear the story you all, framing the issues that effectively becomes agenda setting setting that what, what is popping up out of the stories and, and hearing what's happened to people. What are the issues that we need to frame back to them and agree with them? Are these three or four things that now uh, in a community dispute about noise or about dogs or something? And then to move on into problem solving. So we ad adapted, so we, 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 we went for a five stage model. Um, but since then, we've added a lot to storytelling to, to stage number two, and, and I've developed that you can break that down into sub stages of surface talk, uh, uh, hearing each other's story, and then the shared uh, hearing, uh, shared hearing each other, and hopefully you arrive at what we might call the humanizing moment, the transformation. People call it the the recognition moment. Um, so. Uh, we went for five because, you see, we thought uh, trainers, volunteers uh, who are going to be mediators uh, in a community dispute, they're not going to remember seven stages, but they're going to remember three or four or at the most five. I mean, if you get to, to number five, well, then <laughs> you're home and dry. But so there's, there's three and, and, you, and you've done your, you get your nice two opening. So you're really just trying to manage three bits, the storytelling, we're getting the, uh, identifying the issues that arise from that, and then on into problem solving. So um, we thought that's gonna be much easier to teach. And amazingly, this model, uh, I've trained hundreds in it and others have trained people in it. So this has effectively became the Irish uh, mediation model um, that, that is is dominant now across the particularly in terms of face-to-face -face training obviously the shuttle mediation stuff the commercial mediators is slightly different but they love hearing a little bit about this model um, and then we added for workplace disputes we added in the pre-mediation sessions so that's why we have up the top body A and body B that we uh, we meet them separately well, in the community mediation, we have always met people separately as well. And particularly for workplace disputes, we think interpersonal disputes around bullying or harassment, it's so important to meet each of the parties before going into um, the, uh, the, the, particularly the storytelling uh, piece of work. So that, that uh, um, uh, was really very significant. And again, we're so grateful both the, from the, to, to the Mennonites and to community boards for uh, giving us the training. And, and what was really helpful 
and I'll go back to the, the main screen again, um, uh, is that um, is, uh, we kept up the contacts with America uh, during the 80s and, and, well, and particularly into the 90s. Um, I became a, par I got, became a, a part time family mediator with the family mediation service. And um, we were, we had John Haynes over. So almost each wave of the mediation movement in the States, we were able to connect with and met, met them at things like the, what was, what was called the NCPCR. I don't know if anybody still remembers those moments. Uh, mm -hmm. The National Conference on Peace, Peacemaking and PC or and Conflict Resolution. I think it's, right. that, that was right. right. And then that folded in. Well, then there was the Academy of Family Mediators with John Haynes formed, and then that went into the ACR. Um, and I think, and then the NCPCR sort of went into that, old, that got all amalgamated. But th those turned out to be very important formational contacts and meetings and and we're, we're forever grateful that many of you in the North America came over to Ireland at our invitation and helped us to, to build um, uh, the mediation process in Ireland. But the wonderful thing, I'll just interrupt you for a second, as I'm listening to you, Jeffrey, is that rather than just sort of swallowing whole mm. what you may have heard uh, whether it was from uh, Ray Schoenholz or Ron Crayville or Adam Curl, you figured out among yourselves mm. the way in which to take those ideas and manage them and reorganize, shape them so mm. that they fit the, the people and the culture yeah. in which mm. you're working. Mm. Mm. Well, it, it, we, we were very blessed with our own thinking processes or, or right. people who come from different worlds, the kind of um, Delmer came from, from therapy and somebody else came from, the, Mary Lloyd came from the legal world. Uh, and so we, were, we had a blending of different professions and different skills. So that was all in the mix as to, uh, to figure out uh, what was going to work but uh, it what's been fantastic is that the storytelling approach has become the dominant uh process at least up to now i i'm afraid commercial mediation has come in uh, at the top uh, and we're afraid that they are taking it away under legislation and we're losing the relational the joint face-to-face -face relational work that still needs to be done uh, and not and not be dominated by the shuttle there are, obviously there's we have to learn about shuttle we, we all there is no there was no one mediation model uh, and I think it 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 behoves all of us as mediators to learn the different models and not uh, not to be able to be good at storytelling when it's needed but being able to, sh to do shuttle mediation when we have to do shuttle mediation, uh, both before we, we, the G meeting and, and, and subsequently, maybe particularly during the problem solving phase of, of mediation. Uh, so we, we, we all, so I, I believe it's, I, I just happened the other day to see Zena Zumater's article, which is done very well, where she, talked about where, where she put the emphasis on style, a facilitative style, an evaluative style, and a transformational style. And I, yes, yeah, style is important, but each, each of those models, uh, they, there are different, they are different process models. Uh, and so even though we might come with, um, a, a more kind of relational style, uh, it behoves us to learn the methodology and the process steps of each of the mediation models so that we are able to, to move or shift from one way of one method or one, one model into a mo another model and not stay in one, only one model uh, all the time. Yeah, and I don't think that those, um... 
those are styles. I think, as you say, they're models. They have uh, not just techniques associated with them, but they have a set of values, of principles, of beliefs yes. that, uh, that are the foundation for the use of, of techniques in certain ways for certain purposes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and to understand those different beliefs gives us the ability, um, in the same way that you're talking about building relationships, mm. um, you know, we build a relationship in a sense among the models by understanding them. And then we can choose how best to use a particular technique or a model consistent mm. with our understanding of what's going on for the, the people we're working with. Yeah. One of the great values of, because I learned this craft uh, way back in the 80s and I've been at it for the, what was that, mate? what is it, 40 years or something, um, is I've had a chance to uh, do all sorts of cases. Um, what, because in, in Ireland, you well, maybe now you have to specialize a bit more, but uh, when I, in the kind of pioneering years, I was involved in and helping people um, to, to see the value of the different approaches or the different contexts. Um, so what, 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 one of the last big pieces of work I got involved in was restorative justice. I prefer to call it relational justice because uh, we're not necessarily restoring a, a, a relationship that was there in the beginning. Uh, but what that taught me was how much pre-mediation work you have to do uh, before you can invite people into a joint session. And then when you do invite them into a joint session, sure, <laughs> you don't, the role of the facilitator is almost to do nothing. <laughs> it, it's, it's a very low level facilitation. Uh, you, you, your work is more about eye contact, connecting, maintaining eye contact with the victim and the perpetrator, uh, but enabling them uh, to, 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 uh, to process what it is that they want to say directly to each other. Uh, but it's crucial that they know you're there because, the, the, because you're holding or they're trusting the process and they're trusting that you as a facilitator are, have created a safe space. So it, it brings us back to the basics um, of what facilitation is about, of, 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 of enabling people to, to enter that space uh, and to, to to hold to hold that space and to really hear and listen what each other is saying, and and the mediator doesn't. Uh, well, I, I think it's best that we don't call. Um, well, I, I don't use the term mediator for relational justice type things. I call your role is a facilitator of the new understandings that are emerging, or facilitating the, the take, taking of turns uh, and the pacing of hearing each other and being able to check out which bit that is not yet understood by one side with the other. In, in that sense, I've always found uh, Carl Rogers, uh, he, he devised a thing called the bilateral check. And I've always, I, I find that very helpful at a certain stage. It doesn't, it doesn't come at the beginning of storytelling, but becomes near, uh, uh, becomes sort of in the third phase of storytelling where you're enabling one person to ask of the other, uh, which bit, Mary, do you not yet understand uh, about what John is saying or, or, or what's the other bit? Which, which bit, John, is that you don't think Mary uh, is, is not getting about what you're saying? Mm -hmm. So in I've discovered that that's a crucial question to ask when people are in coming out of, of bullying situations or more uh, where, where something happened uh, and the penny has not yet dropped and we need to go back through that to find out what it is that was the hurt. Because if we can hear and acknowledge the hurt that happened, then that's the break. That's where the breakthrough comes. But if people walk out with not without having the hurt heard and acknowledged. And uh, I, I, 
I, I, I say this, it's not just hearing it, it's not, it's, not, it's not just understanding it, but it's also validating it and acknowledging it. There are deeper layers there. Uh, and if we are able to get work through those layers, well, then we get, which, which comes back to the very beginning, then we get to reconciliation, <laughs> uh, how you actually do reconciliation work. And I think a bit like we've, I found with Mark Umbright, who developed relational justice work, starts justice work. He says, when you get to those moments of forgiveness or reconciliation or the humanizing moment, well, people don't use those big words. You know, it's such an interactive, instinctive thing. And it's probably, uh, and we, we, we shouldn't be moralizing on it either. Uh, so they, forgiveness, uh, we don't mention the F word or reconciliation, the R word, or, or indeed the H, the, the humanizing word, um, uh, but, but it's there, it's happening. And, and well, maybe we, we in, the, in, the, in the work afterwards, but I, I, I think I've found in reflecting on those moments that you, you discover how sacred those moments are. And they are uh, deeply connected to spirit. Uh, um, so I've, I've learned that in my later life, you know, <laughs> not when I was doing it, I was doing it, but I, I wouldn't have probably read into it, maybe just as well, <laughs> uh, some, some of the kind of the, the, the sacredness uh, of, of what happens when people really connect and hear and understand each other. And the, I think what's interesting, Jeffrey, as I listen about this, I'm thinking that all that you've talked about with regard to relational justice is equally applicable in, in different ways to a family dispute, a workplace dispute, a community dispute, in the sense that if storytelling is important, mm. if it's important for people to be heard yeah. and validated yeah. what they have to say, yeah. then it can also be helpful when people are just engaged in what we might think of as problem solving, mm. deciding what to do, for example, about a sum of money mm. um, that doesn't seem to, that doesn't have the same spiritual quality as, um, as you've described between a perpetrator and a victim. Mm -hmm. but nevertheless has a human quality to it, a human yeah. dimension. Well, the, the, uh, uh, in commercial mediations, there's less possibility for that because it tends to be 90% of it is shuttle mediation. So right. the mediator is shuttling between the parties. He can maybe, he or she can bring maybe some of those messages, uh, but the focus well, is crunching the numbers or... Uh, and so there's less possibility, unless, of course, you are able to bring them near the end back into a joint session and enable then uh, the, the relationship to be rebuilt or, 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 or through the learnings or, uh, of what has happened to be able to, to uh, work through that. But, but commercial mediation tends not to be about rebuilding the relationship. It, it tend to be um, very much um, getting the problem solved uh, and, and div effectively divorce. Uh, uh, people aren't going to go or won't be meeting each other again. But in Ireland, you see, business is a small world. Uh, you're, you could well meet up again or, or the next generation. Oh, my father was in a dispute with, with you lot uh, 30 or 40, and he told me about this or told me about that. So, you know, we're a small society and that's why relationships still are, well, I hope they will remain important. That's, that's been so much a key part of our culture, uh, whether it's going to change or is changing, hopefully not. Um, and, and that uh, we're, we're, we're keeping relationships um, uh, will will remain embedded uh, that it is embedded in the culture and hopefully it will stay embedded in the culture. Yeah. And and I wonder if that leads us to talking about your work at 
at Glen Cree and your work um, uh, with people whose relationships have been fractured in ways that are um, where there's not just an upheaval, but there's also violence. Mm. Okay. Well, um, I left the story a bit about um, uh, at Glen Cree. Uh, I, I never became, I was never employed by Glen Cree, but I've been in and out and helping them at, uh, doing different things. So, but a crucial moment came in 1994 when to the back channels, uh, the IRA and the Republicans and the Loyalists were brought into ceasefires. The, the first ceasefire came in August 1994, followed by the Loyalist ceasefire. And that just transformed the whole situation. It, 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 it enabled the, the peace process to come out into the, the open. So we at Glen Cree, I, I, um, we, 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 I, we started a political dialogue uh, workshops. So just to, to, I left off the story, I think about um, um, where, where I got in contact with the states and the mediation and so on. Uh, an important new contact uh, in the early 90s was with Herb Kelman in Harvard, who had developed uh, these problem solving workshops between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and it, it, he probably had a role to play in the, the, in the backup or in, in the early days of creating the, the peace process, because some of the people he was involved in were also part of the back channel Oslo talks, which the Norwegians um, facilitated. And that was an amazing experience for us because, well, if a small nation like Norway, Norway can be uh, uh, operating the background, well, of course, we Irish, we can even do it better, you know? <laughs> anyway, it was a marvelous uh, uh, metaphor and example of what a small nation could do. So uh, it so happened that a, a guy from Ireland called Hugh O'Doherty uh, went, went to Harvard and, had, and did courses with Herb. And, and that was one of the ways by which I, can't, I, I was able to meet up with Herb. So we, 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 I just jumped on this problem solving approach. Um, because, one, because it was what was being called second track. It, it, was, it, it was the track below the top level. And secondly, it was interactive, um, private in residential workshops. So that got away, that, that solved the dilemma that I was working on we had to stop these public meetings of politicians sitting and grandstanding behind a um, uh, table, uh, the, the top table. Uh, and so uh, we, were, we were just very fortunate that I had got to know this process or, and had tried it out with you in one or two little occasions. And it was just fantastic. Uh, 1994, August, um, we had Suddenly, the wind was changing. The, well, there was a game changer of the ceasefire, uh, uh, ceasefires, and um, people were wanting the opportunity to, to come and talk. And so there we were, Glen Cree. We had just opened, reopened Glen Cree because uh, we got some money together again, particularly American philanthropist called Chuck Feeney enabled us to get the program going. And um, so we, we, got, we had the center opened and we had the wind, the political wind in our favor. And the challenge was, could we do it? And we devised, I, I adapted problem solving to political dialogue. So the problem solving approach of Herbert was, was tended to be, well, it, was, it tended to be cross bilateral Israelis and Palestinians, but they would sit around a table and it was a bit formal, you know, um, and you had, it was a cognitive approach because it was very much linked to helping them to do conflict analysis. And so he brought, the aim was that, that they as academics who could be neutral, um, and might be one or two other academics would come in and to help the politicians think through and analyze 
and work through solutions. So that was particularly true for the, the period, the pre ceasefire period, if you like. Um, but when you get the ceasefire, uh, we again in Irish storytelling uh, mode, we didn't, we threw out the table and we just had uh, seats a circle. And at Glen with it, we had this wonderful little room with a fireplace. And uh, we got middle class families up in Dublin who were. Uh, throwing out their sofas, wanted some place to dump the sofas. So we said, oh, we'll, we'll take them. And so we, we had a, a kind of a, a circle. Uh, well, it was more, it was a square room, um, but effectively it was a kind of circle. Uh, and they were sitting in sofas. Now, of course, some people will have used sofas and fall asleep during, particularly after the night before. <laughs> but uh, it created this cosy um, fireplace chat. Uh, for people to sit and talk, and um, and I, in a very privileged role of being a facilitator of that, coming with my storytelling type of process. So it, 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 it here it was just fantastic because here were politicians who had had wanted to talk, uh, and and we could bring Sinn Fein IRA into the room, and they could talk. Uh, they want a chance to reconnect with the other political parties. So um, in the period 94, over four years up to the Good Friday Agreement, effectively our dialogue workshops parallel, we were doing a parallel process as the higher level um, discussions were taking place. And what we found then was that, that, that um, we had people close to the politicians, the, the decision makers in Dublin. And, and so they were young. I mean, when I say young, I mean, they were in their mid twenties, late twenties. Um, they realized that if they came to the Glencree unionists and indeed nationalists, if they came to the workshops in Dublin, they'd hear about what the Irish government was thinking, and then they could bring it back to their executive committees and policymaking people. And we had a, we a lovely virtuous circle because then they could bring stuff back from there. So we were, we were always about two months ahead of where of things hitting the, the, the public sphere. And uh, it, 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 they got to know each other so well. Obviously, the early stages were a bit difficult, but, but to teasing out and hearing and understanding. We didn't put pressure on people to come to outcomes say like a problem solving workshop but it was again to use yeah that, that team that i i talked about adam curl uh, new relationship being formed through hearing uh where people came from and the difficulties and the suffering that they had and then out of that comes new understandings uh, and the themes and issues um that needed to be talked about at that stage in the peace process uh, and so it, it, it became, uh, I, I'm only hearing now, what, 20 years later, or well, it's longer, but you know, maybe 10 years ago, about what happened in between the workshops. I didn't know what was going on uh, uh, between them, um, but th there was a chemistry of the relationships. And so, and then we had, the, we had British, young, youngish British, uh, uh, party people like the Labour Party and Serbia coming over. And what we were finding is they went back and, and because they knew now or, or had understood a lot more what this doom and Irish situation is, they were able to write the speeches for frontline spokesmen uh, over in the, in the House of Commons. And likewise, uh, a few people in, in our workshops were writing the speeches for leaders both in the North and in the South. So, uh, there you are. <laughs> you never know when you start something where it's going to go. But I think we learned from Herb, um, it has to be residential. Uh, he, his work, I think, tended to be about four or five days. Ours was weekends because the, the lads couldn't, they were mainly lads. Uh, and that means men, uh, in case uh, <laughs> it doesn't transfer across the Atlantic. Um, uh, and um, although we, we, we were trying to get women involved 
but it, it, it politics up north was, was, was very male dominated at that stage. And so um, uh, we, we people, yeah, so, so I'm saying it was re because it was residential and in Irish style, then you, we, you, you had a nice meal together and we did have whiskey there and we did have wine or, or beer. Uh, with an honesty bar, I just put money in. <laughs> so, but we, what we found was the English went to bed around half 12, whereas the Irish stayed up uh, for one, two or three o'clock. And, and that proved crucial because that's, that's where the real storytelling happened in the, in the informal hours and people getting to know, know each other. Uh, so, so the residential, the the um, the informal um, and the, I mean yeah, and we did it uh, like like what Herbert's discovering you you keep doing it you don't just have one but you you you, you keep inviting back the same people but we, we we never met we never created a closed workshop we always invited others uh, to come um, because we were linked to to party structures uh, political party structures I mean. And um, it just developed in an incremental way. Uh, and um, so it, they, they were, it was a great experience. So I, I, that, that, just to complete this bit about political dialogue, after the Good Friday Agreement, we kept doing it. But in that case, it was now the pro-agreement people meeting the anti-agreement people. Uh, and, and amazing because some of the people that were in the room before the Good Friday Agreement were on the anti-agreement side. So we had built up the contact, so they wanted the chance to come back and to explain to the pro-agreement people some of the issues. And then the, the other phase after 2004, uh, when the, 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 the Northern Ireland executive, executive collapsed, we did a crucial piece of work with the DUP, which would have wedded parties to the agreement, but they came down and met with Southern politicians and leading to the 2007 um, agreement, the St. Andrew's agreement, that got the executive back up again. So they are uh, second track dialogue workshops can play a crucial role in, in keeping the momentum going, enabling people to talk to each other and allowing new ideas and, and the circulation of ideas to, to happen. And, and you're thinking, though, in addition to having that extraordinary experience of uh, playing such a vital role, um, you've been thinking again about how you structure multi-track diplomacy. Yeah. Um, is there something you want to share with us about, yeah, we, we, about we, some of that? We, 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 I, I suppose that the, the, at, at that time, the... Um, the, um, just, uh, is that coming up yet? Uh, we, we just, see the, the um, right, there we are now. Oh yes, brilliant. Yeah. So, right. so w what's emerging in the last couple of years is a notion of multi-track. So what I've been talking there about was track two, which um, in Kelman's terms is the sub-leadership or the, 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 the influentials who are on their way up or the influentials who aren't at the top table but are, in connected, are connected to the top table. So the, 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 the terminology here is unofficial. Uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not, track one is seen as the official government layer. Uh, and, um, and it's as things are teased through and worked through at track, at track two. Um, and that can happen in problem solving workshops as well. But I, and, and in, well, indeed, some of our dialogue workshops moved up, moved into problem solving at stages. So um, the, 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 the next thing that sort of came along was uh, between track through two and track one. Um, and so it, it has been called in the literature track 1.5. <laughs> um, and uh, when we look back at what happened in our peace process, it's, it's now, it's, we can pick out 
different types of things where officials, that diplomats or, or government officials, met unofficially. They went and they, they came, uh, I mean, uh, the, the famous one was um, Jonathan Powell, who wants to meet Mark McGuinness in, in Derry, and he flies uh, into Derry Airport, and he gets a taxi into Derry, and he's told to stand on a, on a certain street with the Financial Times that day, and he gets picked up and uh, into a black taxi, and they take him around Derry for about an hour, and then dump him into um, Martin McGuinness's house. <laughs> and so, uh, to so that's an official. Jonathan Powell was chief of staff of Tony Blair's office, so it's an official. But he's meeting very unofficially and in secret with the crucial uh, decision makers uh, in in the top leaders in in that in Sinn Fein and Martin had connections, well, previous connections, um, you know, ongoing connections <laughs> with the IRA. Uh, and we're now learning again because this was never talked about. We're learning more about some of these things that happened um, behind the scenes. Uh, and uh, but uh, leading up to negotiations, during the negotiations, and in the implementation, particularly the decommissioning uh, of arms. Uh, so it's a, it's a vital area, and um, I, I should say that this is also about internal mediators or internal facilitators. It's not uh, Americans <laughs> flying in by helicopter or otherwise from outside um, uh, solving it for us uh, here we, we, we were we were very fortunate in in Irish people coming forward uh, if, if therefore internal to the culture one of the most famous people was who did this huge piece of work was father Alec Reed a, a redemptist priest in the Clonard monastery and he, he could be described as track 1.5 in connecting politicians and with the Irish government and uh, uh, and, and and other, particularly the, the Republican community. So, you, uh, track two became quite well known. I mean, it, it derives from uh, Hugh Hugh um, uh, Hugh uh, No, it's, it's uh, anyway from Montville. He was a a, a, a he, he was in the American uh, um, Secretary of State's office, and um, he realized that you could, he, he was track one professionally, but he saw the value of track two. Now, I, I remember going to meetings in uh, conferences in the States, and I met Ambassador John McDonald, Donald of, um, who was a bit like Montville, uh, and he and Louise Diamond, they developed what was called multi-track uh, diplomacy. Right. So up, up to then, track two, Monfil had already, had always described it as diplomacy. But it's us as peacemakers, I think we need to reshape the, we're reframing the word diplomacy because it's actually about peacemaking and peace building. And for me, those are two separate, uh, they're, well, they're two sides of the coin. But they are they are different types of work, um, and w when I first I, I remember meeting John McDonald at one of the, the those conferences like NCPCR or something, and I, coming from civil society or coming from Glen Cree, I thought, wow, that's that's fantastic, multi-track uh, approach, multi-track uh, diplomacy or multi-track peacemaking, but they came up with nine tracks. Oh um, and they described that as, as uh, the, you need the business involved, the journalists involved, civil society groups, um, local citizens, uh, um, philanthropists, the universities. So, um, but some of these are vertical, you know, the churches uh, are, operate at, at the, the different levels, the different tracks. So, um, what we're trying to do here is not is, is build, well building on on 
on a multi-track approach or taking that concept uh, that John McDonald Louise Diamond developed, but more talking about levels or layers. Uh, John Paul Lederach was helped us there in describing three layers, um, the, the, the top, the middle, and the, the, the community layer. So uh, I, I, that's why, and he, he introduced, he put it into, he's, he's good, he thinks visually. So he, he created a diamond approach. So, so here we have the letter act diamond, but I've superimposed the, the track, track, the track one, track 1.5, track two. And then what's emerging is to describe uh, track three is the community-based uh, work that becomes the social glue um, that can often hold, hold a peace process together. If it's all up at the top, it's not, we, we know that in the implementation of the peace process, it's simply not going to, it has to be deepened, has to come down and, and support um, uh, peace process. Uh, or deepen it. I'll tell you a story. Um, I was in Israel, sorry, I was in, in Rome with a group of American academics introducing as a preliminary workshop to go to Kosovo, to, to go to, to Bosnia to have a look at the situation there. So it, the organizers invited in the, is, the Israeli ambassador to the Vatican. He was nearing his retirement. So he says, you know, what I've learned is that the Oslo process didn't work because it was up at track one. Uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't come down and it didn't, didn't uh, right. bring NGOs or the, 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 the Jewish world or the Palestinian world uh, with it to, the, to, to really to support it. And he did say he thought the Irish process uh, it was very much better at bottom-up activities or bottom-up support. Uh, but instead of saying, he, because he was talking about top-down approaches, <laughs> he didn't realize what he was saying was, what we need is bottom-down approaches. Uh, and we all knew that he was actually talking about bottom-up approaches. Right. Uh, we pointed this out to him later. Mm. But the thought stuck with me <laughs> that... Uh, it's not just bottom-up approaches, but we actually also need, in a Freudian way, bottom-down approaches. And that's where I uh, add in now track four, because it's a, it's a bottom-down approach to working with unresolved pain, uh, unresolved hurt, uh, and the, the trauma that has not yet been worked through. Uh, and... Um, we, we've discovered in the Irish situation how important it is to work with victims and with the ex-combatants to work through the trauma that they have been through. Uh, and it's quieter work. And so it's different from track three, which is more public or it's, it's more about intercommunal uh, community dialogue uh, across the, the communities and the neighborhoods. And, um, uh, and so, so Glenn Cree has, uh, alongside the political workshops of track two, we have found a particular niche to develop the, the healing process down at track four. Can you say a little bit about that? Um, we don't have a great deal more time, but I, I want to be sure because yeah. um, you were kind enough not only to give me a tour of Glen Cree when I visited with you, um, uh, and to spend the time talking with you uh, about yeah. the work, but you described and actually showed us yeah. room where people meet for the healing process. And I think it's a very, um, it's a, it's a, it's a crucial piece of uh, of the work of peace building. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when you use the term peace building, um, I see the relational work as as about peacemaking, and I see the the, the blocks of peace uh, about peace building. And when I mean blocks of peace, 
uh, in, in our peace process, it was different stages that we got to um, uh, different uh, either statements or declarations or agreements uh, before we got the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement is seen as a big moment, but in fact, uh, something like 20 years of work went into that. And, and, uh, and based upon that, we were, I've identified eight building blocks that went, that we got to. The, the, well, that's uh, the peace building, are the peace blocks, building. those large, yeah. and the peacemaking is so, relational. Is exactly, and it's when people are, the dialogue that needs to happen, uh, and the understandings that need to happen. So in, if we're doing track four, um, what's crucial is for, well, we were lucky that in, in, more, in the more recent work we've done, um, the Protestant Unionist population found it much more difficult to come to terms with the violence. But we, we managed to come and get, make contact with a group and the, and the border area, um, uh, the border area meaning between the, the south and the north, um, where uh, ex policemen and ex army people they were retiring out of that work, but still with memories of the past and still suffering or still um, being affected. And of course, when they came out of their work uh, into retirement, it it started to come up into dreams or come up, come up into nightmares. And uh, that, that their particular group worked on trauma recovery, on storytelling. So, uh, so the, the bit that we were able to contribute was um, that they would have seen the South as the haven, safe haven for Republicans. That's not actually what happened, but that's their perception of what happened. Uh, well, I, I don't say it didn't happen, of course it did happen, but uh, the state, uh, there was a misperception of what the, the role that the state actually played. Um, and uh, so we were able, uh, in our Glen Cree room, we were able to have space for about 40, a circle for about 40 seats. We we're a bit reticent about going up to 40 uh, seats, um, and uh, we thought maybe an inner circle might be better and then an outer circle, but then that created um, a, a primacy of, of the inner group and, and others listening in the outer group. So it was terribly important that we had one big circle. And so families, um, husbands, wives, particularly husbands who were uh, in the police force and in the army, but also wives who had th those experiences of would their husband ever come back and they'd be waiting up till early hours in the morning. So they went through a lot of trauma and uh, it was only after the, the Good Friday Agreement could they then relax, um, but still major mistrust and suspicion between them and their local neighbors, um, uh, particularly Catholic farmers, um, as to whether could they ever trust them again. Uh, so what, what we did was uh, we, we brought from our side uh, down south, we brought together uh, key um, uh, stake, uh, well, uh, Irish policemen who'd served on the border or an army person in the south who'd served on the border. But we also got uh, one or two people who worked in the Department of Justice who would have been having to handle many of those cases, uh, or, or the guard, the special branch from the guards. Uh, and then we, we were fortunate in one of the meetings to have a former minister for justice, uh, minister meaning government minister, to come into the circle together with, with, with interspersed with, with listeners like ourselves uh, from Glen Cree. So it was an amazing experience for them to come so that they could tell the story, not to themselves, but to these others <laughs> outside of the state. And for many, they had never, well, had very traveled very little to the South, um, but to be welcomed to a safe space so that their story and their hurts and their pain could be heard and acknowledged. 
was uh, uh, we, we call it the speak out moment that they're able to speak out. Um, they've got to the stage of not just holding it to themselves, but talking among themselves, but now being able to tell the other what they had been through. And uh, I, so for me, those are moments of deep acknowledgement that we could acknowledge and hear what they had been through. Um, and, and we would, it was a little bit from our side of what, what, what uh, to, to correct or to work through for us to make some sense of, of their perceptions of us and to help them to, to understand some of the realities that we had to face and that we had to, in our struggle against the violence of the IRA. Uh, and so it, it was, a, a, therefore, it was a double agenda of hearing the stories, but also of working through some of the, rea some of the, to, to hear their realities and to counterpose it with, with, with the realities that we, that were there also, uh, uh, and the constraints that were there. Um, so it, it, we did that about three or four times uh, with that particular group and we've done it with other groups since um, uh, but, uh, we, we did this work with mainly catholic groups much earlier immediately after the good friday agreement but protestant communities were not ready for it then uh, it, it, it took it took 10 well more it took 15 years or more um, for them to process it and to to be able to come into such a space. Because you have situation and, and two things I was thinking of. One is that um, nobody has to, there's no sense that you have to prove yourself right. Mm -hmm. that, that, that somebody has to say, oh, of course, that's, that's, you know, this was each person is describing their reality, their experience, yeah. Um, the impact on them yes. without necessarily having to say that that is, that that means that your reality doesn't matter exactly. because it's different from mine. Yes. And, and to, to, to have that reality acknowledged from the outsider um, and to hear and to have the impact, the emotional impact that those years, those events had on them and their families, to have that acknowledged uh, was, I suppose it's reaffirming or it's, it allows them, I hope, to, to heal uh, and to move, move beyond. We, we have, you know, you know, there's this big, big phrase called emotional closure. Well, we, we know we never get emotional closure, but you can, get a little bit of closure or uh, um, there's a big pressure from society or can't they just move on yeah. you know can, uh, we, we, we're in a different world now and forget about the past J just we, 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 you know we don't want to talk about it so so this this year in particular is the centenary of 100 years later of of the birth of southern ireland and northern ireland and we went through a difficult time of war of independence. And um, so I, I did a session there about two or three weeks ago um, down in West Cork in Ireland, uh, where um, really the question was, what did you hear your granny or your grandfather say about the past? Uh, and they heard these stories uh, and it was a chance for them to tell each other what they had heard and to piece together the, the pieces of the jigsaw, but in the light of also modern day reality. Uh, it, it, I, I learned a bit of that from here. Dan Baran talked to the survivors of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Israel, they found that um, when the survivors came to Israel, um, uh, they were very silent. They wouldn't talk about the Holocaust, about what had happened to them. And so they wanted to protect their children um, that, grew, that they were brought up in the new, in the new land. 
So, but what Dan Baran found was that by going to the schools uh, and talk to the grandchildren, and he gave them a task, uh, Johnny, or it wouldn't be Johnny out in his <laughs> it would be, I don't know, uh, Isaiah, go, go, go over, or Yitzhak, go, go home and ask these two questions of your grandmother or grandfather about what it was like. And amazingly, the grandparents were, what, 40, 50 years later, even six, well, maybe as many as 60, could, could feel free to talk about, talk then about what they had been through, things that never told their own children. And so the grandchildren then would, would run to, to their parents, oh, daddy, daddy, mommy, mommy, do, do, do you know what granny told me? Do you know what granddad told me? Oh, I never heard that, says dad or mother, you know? So there was a fascinating intergenerational storytelling um, that, that, could fr that freed up the family uh, about what had happened in the past. So, so 100 years ago, uh, that, that's a, we, we can still, we just still need to do work on what we hear from the past and, and what's handed down to us. And also maybe with also historical realities of, of what I, I, that we can learn more about what actually happened. Yeah, either because I mean, in this country, we're still dealing with the Civil War. Yeah. Um, and people's perceptions about what the Civil War was about and who fought and why. And, and it's a um, hundred and almost 150 years later. Mm -hmm. um, it is more than 150 years. The Civil War in this country ended in 1865. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you still have, mm -hmm. you know, um, people who have, who tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, now it's because there are so many generations that have passed. It's, yeah, but there's still stories that have been passed down, um, you know, transmuted and modified and, um, and uh, re re retrofitted in order to accomplish some current need. And um, yeah, and if we're, if this country is ever going to really get past that, it isn't just the passage of time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those stories need to be heard and shared, uh, but it might might take two or three stages that you share it among your own group before you're able to share it with others. Uh, I mean, I found in, in uh, for some of the folk in West Cork who have now fully integrated into, uh, they, they were Protestants, uh, they fully integrated into uh, uh, social life and community life that when I suggested or explored with them, maybe would you, would you like to be able to share those stories with uh, the other side of the community? It was still, still difficult, still no, it, they were still maybe a bit concerned uh, that there might be some backlash or get quotes around circle of people because um, they, they experienced the, um, when some of the stuff came out about 20 years ago, um, some rogue elements or, uh, uh, came and knocked down the gravestones uh, of, those, of, of those who uh, were killed uh, around that time. So you can see it's amazing how, it, it, is it a virus, a virus of violence or a virus that stays on? But there's something with the gut thing that gets taught and retaught. So that's why we're doing a bit of work on narratives about how do you reconstruct narratives. But but well, the sociologists will talk about reconstructing narratives. But it's a it's a relational piece of work. You can't you, you can't talk with with people about reconstructing their narrative. We need to hear. But there is about reinterpreting or re rethinking the narratives um, as to what, what, what they heard, but what now needs, what's now relevant, or how, to, how, we, how we take the hurt from that and the toxicity from the past so that we can 
uh, take those key principles or key things in the narrative and re reinterpret them or reframe them for a new context in a very different world that we're living in now. And so that's where your work is taking you. That's the future for your work. It, it could well be, I think so, yeah. Um, we have to think through as to how we do that. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we mean it, well, it, we've done it uh, in, in, in some of the exchanges that we had between the victims who had worked through, had gone through three or four stages of their trauma recovery. They met up with uh, some former combatants uh, on the loyalist and Republican side. And so the, the, the no combatant wants to be faced with the question, um, was it all, was the violence futile? What did you achieve with, through the violence? Uh, and that's hard, that's a very hard question for them because they don't want to betray the people that they went out with or people who have died um, for the cause. Um, but it's about, it, so it, it's about a, a discovery that violence doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and uh, because what, what did the violence actually achieve? Um, and so it's not about betraying your comrades, but it's about how, what do we do with the cause? Does the cause still gets passed on to the next generation of young males who go out and pick up the guns and and uh, and form because the power of of gangs the power of of um groups that are, of the, the adrenaline rush that young boys get but we're doing a little bit of work in haiti at the moment uh, in a very difficult situation and gangs are very strong and of course gangs are being misused or abused by the top level, um, the, 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 the elite who, who import weapons and give them into the hands of the gang leaders. Uh, and as young boys, as young as 14 or even younger, uh, are going around heroes uh, in their local scene. So um, we're, we're <laughs> what do peacemakers do about that? <laughs> uh, and we're doing a little piece of dialogue work uh, at the, the that, so that's where that mo that multi-track model uh, is now operating, because we're we're doing a dialogue at each of those layers, the, the track, well, not track four, but track three, track two, and track one point five, and we're doing, uh, we've got so far as we've had tracks at each of the levels. So I mean, at some stage we need to get what we call the vertical axis whereby a number of people from track three will come and sit with track two and track one. The trouble is uh, we're in COVID uh, and we can't have face-to-face -face dialogue and it all has to be done on Zoom uh, or on WhatsApps uh, or in small rooms where they Zoom each other. Uh, so it's much more difficult, but the, the conflict analysis that is required and the hearing of the real stories of what's happening becomes terribly important to create uh, 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 some new consensus uh, as to where where their society goes. You know, when I, I listen, and we're, we're gonna need to um, end, unfortunately, um, and maybe after we end, we'll plan for the next conversation. But what I think, what I take from, from one of the things I take from our conversation, Jeffrey, is um, a reminder to be patient and persistent mm. about peacemaking mm. because the, the causes of the conflict and the violence and the, uh, and the ways in which that has been carried out occurred for perhaps generations. Mm. And only, and, and we, we tend to think, oh, well, let's just end all of that. You know, so it's been a hundred years. Um, we'll just have, and um, and we'll, you know, our our leaders will come up with a peace building plan, and we'll implement that, and all will be well. Yeah. Without recognizing that it might not take a hundred years to do the peacemaking. Indeed. But it's not. It's not going to happen in weeks. No. 
it, it, it took us 30 years to get the Good Friday Agreement, and it's going to be certainly 30 years afterwards, uh, and maybe more. Uh, and it, it, it's got to do with the suffering that people experienced, and that remains on. Um, and particularly if the historic grievances behind the suffering have not been processed and worked through, right. then those the, the, the next generation feels behoven to keep the fight going, uh, to keep the struggle going, because those historic grievances have not yet been dealt with. Right. Uh, and so, we, we, so, so the we the, the the republics call it the blood sacrifice uh, that that was made by mm -hmm. previous generations and they can't give that up um it's a very profound um, well we, we better not go into the theology of blood no, sacrifice. you know it's, clear, it's a it's both a sobering and an uplifting way to end our conversation okay. <laughs> um, because because in everything that you've described, there is hope. Mm -hmm. And yet there's the reality of the difficulty um, of implementing the process that you've described. And yet there's the hope because you've seen it have impact on individuals and groups. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Jeffrey, thank you for our time today, for the chance to talk with you. Okay. and to hear your insights. It was marvelous. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Michael, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks.